Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all around the globe. Welcome and thank you for being here. I'm Gabor Wischke, technology researcher at NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence with the focus on industrial control system. Regarding SICON, I'm the co-chair of the conference and the manager of the technology track. Today, I'm moderating this panel in which, together with our distinguished speakers, we will focus on cyber threat intelligence that is a vital key to prevent and mitigate cyber attacks. The panel is nicely balanced. Speakers with their experience represent academia, government, and private sector as well. Today, three presentations will be introduced, followed by a discussion. First, Federico Cerutti will introduce an AI-based solution that helps the effective identification and response to cyber threats. After that, we will dig deeper in threat actor characterization. Vasilis Mavrovis will shed light on the details of the topic. The final presentation will be rather practical. Chava Krasnayi and Gergő Jebnar will discuss the possibilities and limitations in cyber threat intelligence with a focus on energy systems. Dear Adrians, all of you are warmly invited to address your questions via chat box or social media. In the case of need, our experts are ready to answer your questions via email as well after the conference. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Federico Ciarutti, who is the chair of Brescia University branch of Italian Cybersecurity uh, Cyber National Laboratory. In 2019, he joined the highly competitive Rita levi Moncianini uh, Personal Research Fellowship Program funded by the Italian Ministry of Research. During his career, he worked as the academic director of Cardiff University, the University's Data Science Academy. He is an active researcher in learning and reasoning with uncertainty and the cyber set intelligence analysis. He published over 70 peer reviewed papers, several was published in top venues for artificial intelligence research. Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, my paper of today is about uh, uh, how an artificial intelligence system can support intelligence analysts for um, effective identification response to cyber threat. And uh, the key element here is the self-aware element at the very beginning, as we will discuss in a few slides. This is a joint work with several colleagues at the University of Gracia in Italy, in particular Pietro Barone, Daniela Foglie, Massimiliano Giacomini, Francesco Gringoli, and Giovanni Guida, and uh, a subject, much, subject matter expert, uh, Paul Sullivan, who is a retired colonel from the US Army. Let's face it, we are going to have significant challenges uh, from this year onwards. The number of threat uh, menace online have been substantially increased, and uh, it is just getting worse and worse every single time. But uh, in these times, it's always useful to come back to the fundamentals. And uh, the fundamentals we have are the, uh, the fact that uh, most of the attacks did not change substantially with the pandemic and with the uh, with several problems going viral in this last uh, few months. But uh, we still have this substantial pattern of reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command control, and then actions and objectives. And this doesn't change much, uh, didn't change much in the last few months, which means that uh, our infrastructure is still quite... Uh, uh, good, we can already have our security operations center, our incident response teams, our information security officer, 
All of that is absolutely brilliant, and uh, uh, we could not be doing what we are doing without all of these personnel. But uh, the real question is, all of them are basing their operation on information, which means that uh, ultimately information is key. And when we talk about information and in intelligence analysis in particular, we are referring to a process that is not terribly new. Every single uh, confrontation, every single battle in the past always had an element of intelligence analysis, which means that we can actually borrow from a substantial, large um, um, literature. <clears throat> and um, among other models, I'm particularly fond of the Pirelli and Card model, uh, looking at, uh, at, at the intelligence analysis as a continuous iterative cycle uh, starting from some direction, setting from a decision maker, posing some questions or requesting some piece of advice, then is the role of the intelligence analyst to uh, go and check for data sources, sources that can become and uh, that can trigger a data collection process. The data is now going into skew boxes, the, from there to evidence file, and this is what uh, is traditionally described as the foraging loop. And then from evidence file, there is a substantial step forward using data processing techniques for entering schema and there, from there to go uh, into the realm of hypothesis thanks to data analysis. And once we have hypothesis, um, it means that we can have some sort of understanding of what is happening in the reality, or at least we have reasons to believe or to not believe some of the different uh, competing hypotheses we have to explain the reality or to uh, understand or to predict what could be happening next. So from hypothesis, that is where most of the critical thinking is happening. And then once the uh, intelligence analyst reached uh, a conclusion, then there is a problem of how to uh, disseminate uh, the, uh, the results to the decision maker. Now, as you can see here, in reality, all of them are uh, uh, different loops, while I just uh, describe it uh, from one end to the other. In reality, an analyst can just start, for instance, from an hypothesis or from other part, and then going through all the various steps. And um, that, um, um, in, in this presentation, I will focus mostly on data processing and data analysis, not just because there are um, uh, that, that, that is where artificial intelligence can be massively useful. And, but I'm not um, saying that uh, data sources uh, or data collection doesn't have uh, their own uh, complexity and their own element of interest. It's just that uh, we needed to focus on some specific aspect of this cycle. And uh, when we are talking about uh, the cycle, we often have these uh, view that uh, we are the good guy ag against uh, some bad guys, but uh, the reality is slightly more complex. The reality is that uh, uh, our adversary are as smart as we are. Our adversary are doing their own counterintelligence uh, operations over our intelligence. So the reality is substantially more complicated. And that's why <clears throat> we need what is the main contribution of this paper, namely desiderata for artificial intelligence systems. So if we want to have an AI system to support an intelligence analysis uh, process, then we discuss what could be the desideratum, the desiderata that uh, we must need to uh, embrace. The first one is we are not here to replace human analysts, and that's why we put as first desideratum the fact that the analyst must be at the center of uh, any endeavor. So ultimately, there, at least at the present time, there will always be a um, um, an human analyst having to answer uh, a request from a decision maker, which means that uh, what we can do to help the analyst uh, is to use a language that is shared between the, the machine and the analyst itself with uh, using specific ontologies, et cetera, et cetera but also having perhaps the possibility to have a 
uh, a dialogue, a continuous dialogue between the analyst and the machine, so to lower the bar to uh, discuss elements with the machine itself. The second element is that uh, there is no certain thing in the world. Everything comes out with shade of, uh, of truth um, and of certainty, which means that uh, there is, we cannot fool the analysts. We need to embrace uncertainty. We need to be able to reason about uncertainty at the machine level, but we need also to be able to explain uncertainty to the final uh, analyst, so to uh, let uh, him or her understand better what is the complexity behind um, the situation we are facing. And then the situation we are facing are not simple events. They are not just one-off. The cyber kill chain is, uh, is, is, is where we started, and it telling, it's telling us that uh, an attack is often a process that spans anything from seconds to minutes to hours, to days, to weeks, to months, sometimes years. Which means that uh, being able to understand that uh, events are connected to each other with temporal causal links and being able to reason about them is absolutely necessary. And all of that takes the, uh, the name of complex event in literature. And finally, because the adversary is as smart as we are, we need to be able to have high order level of uh, thinking, which means that uh, each of our action will have consequences. Each our action might send a message to the attacker, which means that uh, we need to, to, to use strategic thinking whenever we are deciding our countermeasures uh, at any time uh, in the cyber kill chain. Now, the paper goes into details of several elements within all of these desiderata. For this presentation, we just focus on embracing uncertainty, recognize complex events. And um, starting from um, embracing uncertainty, everything, every piece of data comes with shade of uncertainty. And uh, but there are different types of uncertainty. And that has been recognized in literature since quite a long time now. There is the aleatoric uncertainty or aleatory uncertainty. That is the variability in the outcome of an experiment which is inherent uh, to the random element. So if we are flipping a fair coin, the probability of a head or tail will always be 0.5. No additional source of information, but Laplace daemon can reduce such, such a variability. Instead, we have um, another element, another completely different domain um, of uncertainty that takes the name of epistemic uncertainty that is based on the amount of information we have on the phenomenon itself. So if the question goes from uh, what is the probability of having had out of flipping a fair coin into let's evaluate whether the coin is fair observing the output, then it means that uh, if we have three head, two tails, we have a ratio of three to two, uh, we might conclude that uh, the, the, the coin is not fair, but at the same time we should also acknowledge that uh, we are not entirely certain about uh, what is the phenomenon we are observing because we do not have enough data. But if instead we toss the coin 5,000 times and 3,000 times we have had, 2,000 times we have tail, then we can start having a little more of confidence that uh, maybe the, the, the coin is not fair. Which means that uh, what I just described is a manifestation of what is called epistemic uncertainty. And generally, the more the data, the, the lower is the epistemic uncertainty. And that is often linked to uh, the variance of a distribution uh, that is behind uh, the, uh, the representation of the, uh, of the phenomenon we have. So if we take a very simple uh, example of data analysis, we can think about having this one as a, a toy representation of two classes. We have the, the violet and the blue. 
And uh, if we are using a traditional neural network with a softmax layer at the very end, and uh, we are projecting on the background of this picture the confidence, so the sort of representation of, uh, of uncertainty associated with, 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 uh, with what we are uh, classifying, we can see that uh, the darker is where we are more uncertain and the lighter, green, the lighter yellow is where we are um, uh, more certain. So we can see that there is a decision boundary um, separating the left from the right and there in the between is where we are mostly uncertain, right? So what uh, we would like instead to achieve, instead of having this picture where if you take uh, the, uh, the, the, at the bottom part, the star blue, uh, we can see that in the future, in the future uh, representation, if we can just push it a little to the right and we just pass through the decision boundary, then this blue um, star will magically become a purple star. And that is what adversarial machine learning would do. And that is what a smart adversary would do. Just trick a little uh, what is the code behind uh, its attack uh, in order to just push from what can be detected as an attack into uh, what can be seen as a normal piece of software. But instead, what we would like to do is something more complex. We would like to have a more, a, a richer representation of uh, what is the aleatoric and the epistemic uncertainty, which is uh, resulting from research we run with colleagues at Army Research Lab and Osasian University last year. And uh, although that was not in the domain of cybersecurity, that is, that was the inspiration for uh, the work that I'm presenting to you right now. And uh, what we are doing is instead of transforming, uh, having a classification problem uh, resulting in a probability of whether uh, a data point is, let's say, a malware or a non-malware, we now have what we can see on the right part of this slide, uh, um, a, a, a distribution, in particular case, in this case, a beta distribution, that is telling us the distribution of probabilities of, um, of our, um, that our piece of uh, data point is, um, um, is a malware, a piece of malware or not. Now, we can do better than this one. We can transform this one into uh, what is called a subjective logic opinion, that is, uh, more compact representation of this uh, uh, uncertainty element that came up into uh, a triangle of, of, of different uh, uh, opinions, where at the top we have the complete lack of confidence. At the bottom, the more we are getting to the bottom, we are more confident. And then to the left, we not believe something, while on the right, we will believe in something. So in this case, we can just put on the uh, 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 an opinion, a piece of information on this triangle, and that will represent, can be a potential representation uh, for the uncertainty for, uh, for, the, uh, for the final user of this system. And that can also be translated into uh, natural language text. Now, the word is complex, and I was mentioning these, uh, these type of attacks are complex too, which means that uh, what we also need to do is to be able to recognize this complexity and start thinking not just as a single, uh, as a classifying potentially single ele elements of this type of attack, but linking events together. So perhaps um, an attack can start with a, a tra traditional phishing type of attack where we can observe perhaps the logs of our nectar, uh, network and we can see that uh, uh, the 10.1.1.23 the, uh, is accessing a phishing, uh, a phished uh, um, website. And we can do that uh, by using, for instance, we, a neural network that is detecting whether uh, the URL has been phished or not. Um, then we can link together the fact that uh, log uh, 02 and log 04 are coming from the same uh, source IP and the log 04 is downloading something from another website. 
uh, that we perhaps can uh, analyze in a different way with the, that is we generate the ID uh, E05 that is telling us that these are Trojan. So all of that one can aggregate together to inform us that there is an, uh, uh, we are at the stage of delivery of an advanced persistent threat type of attack. And from there then, as I was mentioning, uh, we can have the, the problem of uh, deciding how to respond to this, uh, the, this attack, and for that one, I will refer you to the details in the paper. So to conclude uh, this presentation, in this paper we introduced four desiderata for artificial intelligence systems for supporting intelligence analysis uh, in the cyber threat domain. The first one is to always put the analyst at the center. We are not here to replace uh, the human. We are here to augment our own capabilities. The second one is that we need to embrace uncertainty and the different shade of uncertainty that there are there from aleatoric to epistemic uncertainty. We need to uh, face the fact that uh, we, are a problem, we are addressing problematic uh, si situations that are requiring an analysis of complex events and our opponent is as smart as we are, which means that we need to uh, run our own intelligence, counterintelligence, and strategic thinking whenever we are deciding how to operate with them. With this one, I thank you very much for your attention, and I welcome any question. Federico, thank you very much for your nice and comprehensive presentation. I really liked it, and only one question popped up in my mind. Is this system implemented? Or what are the plans? So the system is currently uh, implemented as research grade prototype in the different parts. Uh, we are currently merging the different parts together. And for that one, uh, we are borrowing from advanced research, in particular in, in, um, in ontologies for cyber threat intelligence analysis. And uh, the idea would be uh, to release it as a platform for research, uh, um, mainly for research. Um, the idea is to also to run experiments with potentially uh, expert user to understand how we can support them better. Um, from a technical perspective, we have already, uh, for instance, all the analysis on uh, epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty is already implemented, is running very nicely out of the box. Uh, for complex event uh, processing, we already have an end-to-end -end system for learning and reasoning on that one, albeit uh, only limited on, on, the, on what type of, or how many levels of causality we can deal with. And uh, for strategic thinking, we already have a system for control query evaluation, which is helping the, the analyst to, um, to understand how much piece of information is revealing with uh, each action and countermeasure is putting forward. Thank you. Uh, I really encourage our kind audience to address the questions, as I mentioned before. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, let's thanks uh, to you. Let's move forward to the next presentation. Our next speaker is Vasilios Mavrovis, who is a research scientist and educator in the cybersecurity at the. Uh, in cybersecurity at the University of Oslo, specialized in security automation and cyber threat intelligence generation, representation, and sharing. He has been affiliated with multiple multinational and European uh, cybersecurity research and innovation project in various role, and has been actively involved in cybersecurity standardization. Vasilios, the floor is yours. Very pleased to be here today to talk about our research on cyber threat intelligence. Um, so today we'll talk about threat actor characterization, meaning how we establish and represent adversarial personas. Uh, we'll discuss the current technological status of that generally, what's the future of it, and uh, we'll discuss a little about the benefits of standardization in cyber threat intelligence with a particular focus on creating vocabularies that we can all use to describe adversaries. And uh, this all together aligned with our research work that was published uh, at the second proceedings on threat actor type inference and characterization, which is just a concrete use case of uh, how universally agreed upon vocabularies uh, 
or simply stated, a language for describing adversaries allow us to easier correlate and uh, analyze different sources of information that describe adversaries, uh, resolve all some ambiguity with respect to their characterization, and uh, gives us the ability to perform reasoning. And um, in our case, uh, reasoning is the ability of machines to infer new information in near real time. Um, actually, surprisingly, an hour ago, uh, I noticed on uh, my LinkedIn feed an article that was published yesterday from Cisco Talos uh, team um, talking about hybridized adversaries that don't really um, nowadays belong exactly to one of the known existing classification categories that they use. Um, in that article, they talk about how they want to more granularly refer to state sponsor related groups uh, by splitting that known category to more based on their different defining characteristics. Uh, in the same article, they also talk about uh, a new type category for threat actors named privateers. And uh, they have come up with uh, criteria a group needs to meet to be classified as a privateer. So, so we can see that understanding the, the traits of adversaries and uh, how their behavior change uh, or not uh, over time is becoming uh, more and more important, more and more apparent. Um, soon enough, um, I do believe that uh, we will reach a point where cyber threat intelligence and uh, in general tracking adversarial groups uh, will become a big data problem. Um, today we track a couple of hundred groups and uh, a really larger number of uh, intrusion sets, but uh, this number will keep increasing. And, and as cyber um, becomes the most prominent way to fulfill uh, nefarious plans, you know, existing adversaries will also demonstrate polymorphic behaviors. They'll start changing, they'll start adapting. Um, and, and polymorphism is a property that we need to start thinking, we need to start tracking and understand. Uh, all those transitions um, have an underlying reason, and uh, uh, maybe, it's it, maybe it's time to start capturing and understanding those transitions and possibly the reasons that influence them. Um, for example, we have seen um, adversaries that were conducting, um, until yesterday, cyber espionage campaigns for geopolitical reasons, uh, but now have transitioned to financially motivated cybercrime. Uh, and this also requires an adversary to utilize um, also a different set of tactics, techniques, and procedures to, to, to achieve its goals. So as defenders, we need to have visibility and knowledge about those things uh, to increase our situational awareness and uh, also transition to more proactive defense um, by mainly having a better way to correlate, further analyze, and query cyber threat intelligence. So if you think about it, um, as of today, we have succeeded to have standard ways to enumerate and characterize um, tactics and techniques with a MITRE uh, attack framework. Uh, we can enumerate and get information about vulnerabilities um, using the uh, CV standard and uh, the National Vulnerability Database. Uh, we have a way to define uh, the severity of a vulnerability uh, by using the um, uh, Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Uh, we even have a way to enumerate uh, in a standard way uh, software by using the Common Platform Enumeration Standard and many other efforts, right? Um, so, so I do believe that it's apparent to, to come up with a common way to describe adversaries. And in other words, uh, their characteristics, uh, their defining attributes. Um, to achieve that, um, we need to develop standard vocabularies that unambiguously enumerate and describe different adversary types like uh, a civil activist, and what is a civil activist? Um, um, organized cybercrime, and what is organized cybercrime? If we talk about adversary motivations, for example, um, what does it mean to be ideologically, politically, um, financially, or, or geopolitically motivated? And make publicly available those vocabularies for use, and their descriptions, right, that will allow to seamlessly, to seamlessly use them. Um, that way, we agree upon the language, we agree upon a common language, and we minimize possibly ambiguity and the difficulty to use it. Um, this is something that the cybersecurity community, or, or even better, the threat intel community, uh, needs to decide together. This is the reason such kind of um, attempts need, need to be uh, standards-based efforts, where we create official groups, um, and we decide all together about common terminology that we all start using uh, in our 
different daily operations, cybersecurity operations. Um, this may be from generating intelligence reports in PDF uh, or sharing cyber threat intelligence using uh, uh, more machine readable ways um, like using sticks. So um, if you take uh, intelligence reports um, or investigate different publicly available adversary knowledge bases uh, today, um, you will notice that even though they are nice to read, it's quite challenging to um, operationalize. This is because most of the time it's entity is using its own vocabulary to describe something. And many times that something is very unambiguous or end up not having the same meaning exactly, uh, even to, um, to another country. Um, the simplest example that I'm always bringing is that um, uh, the, the simple information, right, that an adversary is known to target critical infrastructure. What is critical infrastructure? The United States defines 16 sectors as critical infrastructures, whereas um, the um, European Union's um, NIST directive defines seven. So resolving such kind of um, issues will help. Correlation um, will support understanding adversaries better and in a more temporal way. And at the end of the day, it's all about the ability of threat intelligence. Having those standardized vocabularies will allow defenders to really create and answer more complex questions. And most importantly, um, as presented in our research, um, we will lay the foundation for facilitating information inference, which is the future. Um, since um, a human analyst won't be able to keep up with the insights that a machine can derive. Um, but things like humans um, need to have the ability to understand what we represent unambiguously. So um, in our research in particular, uh, we utilized one of the known early works of um, Team KC and uh, Intel Corporation, known as the Threat Agent Library. So the Threat Agent Library provides us with a comprehensive list of adversary archetypes and their defining attributes, their defining characteristics. And we use this information to develop an ontology. Um, what is an ontology? An ontology is a type of uh, knowledge representation. And um, in our case, we used um, the web ontology language to capture all this existing information from the threat agent library. Um, but now we expressed it using a machine readable approach. So for example, the threat agent library defines um, one archetype this grand employee, and then enumerates the characteristics of this type based on its objectives, the resources of a discrediting employee uh, has access to, uh, their skills, uh, their motivation, and many other attributes. So all these attributes are vocabularies that are used internally. Um, initially, they were used internally at Intel for risk management. This was the reason the threat agent library was created. Um, they are their own standard vocabularies. So in our research, we used um, what is available in the threat agent library with some tweaks to elevate it and resolve possible uh, ontological ambiguities. And um, based on that, we started investigating adversarial operations from publicly available reports um, and created um, and we created adversary profiles based on what we read. Um, by using the reasoning capability of ontologies, uh, we codified the domain expertise that was offered in the threat agent library. And based on that, uh, we could automatically infer the threat actor type for each operation that we investigated. Um, so based on the attributes that we derived um, from investigating, let's say, an operation A, um, we automatically inferred, let's say, that this operation indicates characteristics um, of uh, nation state sponsored activity. And let's say for um, operation B, um, based on the attributes that we derived by reading uh, the intelligence reports, um, we automatically inferred that this activity um, is related to um, cybercrime, to a group that conducts cybercrime. So two operations, um, two different threat actor types, but um, it happens that uh, these operations uh, to be connected. So when these operations um, are connected uh, based on some, let's say, overlapping, overlapping activity or attribution, um, they demonstrate um, different threat actor types that have a relation. Uh, it indicates um, different motivations and objectives and possibly um, different tactics and techniques that this particular 
intrusion set or demonstrate uh, or um, adversary demonstrates. So uh, the conclusion here is that we have the ability to, add, to track adversary polymorphism, an adversary that started yesterday as um, a nation state sponsored group that was mainly geopolitically motivated, has now uh, for a reason transitioned to conducting um, cyber crime. Uh, now it's financially motivated. Um, this is what offers uh, to have standardized vocabularies uh, for describing, characterizing adversaries that no matter who is uh, populating the threat intelligence reports or if it is part of um, threat intelligence sharing efforts, can use. Um, to summarize, the conclusion is that um, we have the ability to track adversary polymorphism and um, also using a set of standard attributes will better allow us to derive more relevant intelligence for our organization and answer more complex questions based on those attributes. Um, yes, and this mainly um, summarizes uh, our research. So if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. Thank you, Vasileos, uh, for your brief presentation. I really liked it, and uh, a question came up. Basically, if we want to, to utilize this uh, common language and the standardized uh, uh, vocabulary, to make it very effective, we have to extend it over the borders so every country should contribute somehow. Who do you think should be the right international organization to lead this project, to lead the standardization and maintaining the cyber attack vocabulary? Uh, that's a good point. So, uh, as I said, uh, in my opinion, uh, it should be a standards-based uh, work. Uh, multiple organizations uh, around the world uh, need to contribute. We all need to agree upon. Um, there is um, a new group, uh, standards track group, that works on that. Um, they are called the Threat Actor Context uh, Community. Um, but uh, here we have two, um, it's two dimensional, right? Because uh, on one side, we have to um, create the vocabularies um, that we are all supposed to you. And then we have also um, the representation problem. Um, and this is again something that um, um, there are multiple threat intelligence platforms. Uh, there are multiple threat intelligence sharing standards. Um, we're also uh, generating threat reports described in prose. So that makes it a, a little more challenging to process. We need most of the times natural language processing. Um, so the problem is uh, two dimensional, but for sure um, um, it should be addressed uh, by um, integrating it within a standards developing uh, organization. I'm not going to take a, a position. I mean, uh, all countries need to contribute. So uh, which organization is it? Uh, it doesn't matter as long as we all contribute to that. We need to agree upon. I agree. Thank you very much. Uh, it was, it was uh, very nice. And, and uh, I think it's uh, very straightforward to set up this kind of uh, initiatives. And uh, I think both of your presentations shed light on the, on the difficulty that we are facing with in the case of uh, cyber threat intelligence. But the next paper that was written by two authors will introduce a kind of solution. Gergő Jebnar, who is the co-author of the paper, is a certified information security professional with more than 10 years of experience in developing and managing international cyber security company. He has grown his skills in delivering high value projects regarding information sharing and analysis centers, security organization centers, cyber security incident response, and related research and development activities. Gergő studied at the National uh, University of Public Service in Hungary, and after a short bypass, he founded his private company, the Black Cell Limited. He strives to share his cloud technology and ICS security-related uh, knowledge and experience in the higher education 
and academia. The other uh, very welcomed author is Chaba Krasnai. He is an associate professor at the National University of Public Service in Hungary. His field of research is cybersecurity. Currently, he is also the head of the university's Institute of Cybersecurity. Besides his activities in higher education, he is present in the public sector as well. Chaba obtained several high-level cybersecurity certifications, and he is a board member of the, of the Magyar Zoltán e-government association and the Hungarian Association for Electronic Signature. In 2011, he was voted to the Security Expert of the Year. Chaba, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and it's absolutely an honor for being here, and we really appreciate the opportunity for uh, giving this presentation together with my co-author, Gergő Gyebnár. And our topic uh, will be some kind uh, of the next steps on the previous presentation. We will talk about our experiences on cyber threat intelligence and information sharing on a national level. And uh, we will focus on the technical difficulties and the technical challenges. But I have to tell you that uh, besides the technicalities, our research is uh, two-threaded. Uh, the first thread is the technical uh, level. The, the second thread is the legislation questions. And we are not doing just uh, by the two institutes uh, what you can see here, but we are also working together with the members, uh, with the actors of the Hungarian electricity systems. So we are working together with power plants, energy uh, companies, and uh, national authorities, and also ICSKDA uh, manufacturers in our country. Therefore, it's quite a complex project, uh, and uh, its major goal is to protect, of course, our nation and our national electricity grid. And uh, I think that uh, the importance of protect the protection of the national electricity grid uh, can't be more emphasized, as it was said uh, by President Biden approximately one month ago, uh, when his executive order says that in 100 days, the uh, US electricity grid should be protected from the attacks uh, from the cyberspace. And the question is, why now? Because they have the NERC SIP, they have the NIST special publications, the 800 and the 1800 series, um, both really well, very well covered, uh, focusing on the, the industrial systems. Uh, they also have um, very huge capacities and huge resources to protect their own national grid. Uh, the attacks against their electricity systems and in general the energy system is nothing new as it was published uh, continuously usually since uh, the mid 2010s um, so why now and just to emphasize more that question how could it happen that uh, in a few uh, weeks ago one of their major critical information infrastructures colonial pipeline uh, was successfully attacked by ransomware uh, by a group called uh, dark side and how could it happen then uh, the uh, supply chain there uh, regarding uh, the uh, um, the pipelines could be halted uh, because of this cyber attack. And that led to a research question, uh, what we asked from ourselves three years ago. And those um, questions were that, first of all, are we able to create the right cyber intel tools, including honeypots and traditional intelligence, uh, to protect our own national grids? Because uh, cyber internet tools, it's obvious, uh, there are a lot of honeypots, honey nets, there are a lot of services, but uh, can we use that in real life? Do we have enough information from that? The second question was, do we have specific information for a mid-sized country's critical information infrastructure that is not a huge market for big vendors and widely used locally developed OT systems? We have a list on the already identified cyber attacks against the electricity systems, and I can tell you that only a few countries uh, notified the public on cyber attacks on their electricity systems. Uh, does that mean that uh, almost 200 countries are not yet attacked 
uh, from the cyberspace. Um, our hypothesis is that it is not true. We simply can't really uh, able to detect such attacks. And of course, um, there are a lot of very good uh, products and, and very, uh, very good solutions to protect uh, the OTA systems. But uh, I have to tell you that in our systems, uh, our vendors are, uh, are, are usually local vendors and they are selling their specific OTA products to the uh, local companies. And the third question is that how can we share information in a local community? Uh, how can we share between local authorities and of course how can uh, local authorities and private companies and how can we share information uh, in transborder relations that is a very very tough question and last but not least do we have the right deep technical standards or recommendations for our critical infrastructures? Because, uh, of course, we can see the uh, US ones, but uh, can we use that in reality? And the answers are very wide. We do really have enough time for that. But just focusing on the technicalities, I pass the word to my co-author, Gergő, who will tell you uh, what were our results uh, from the technical perspective. Really appreciate it, Joe. So. What uh, started us thinking about that there is a need, a sector-specific uh, feed is the noise and the unnecessary computational uh, requirement that is general proposed CTI is required. And the sector-specific use of human threat intel is, 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 is obvious, but if you were running an OT suck and logging uh, into your enterprise SIM to a proper correlation for the OT and IT events, and it works as a tenant weight, then it makes sense that what alerts are generated and forwarded for further analysis and correlation. Not to mention that if you are on that maturity level and uh, where you can do proactive workarounds and approaches like retrospective analysis, where we are using a kind of big data and the numeracy of false positives can also result a kind of big data. So, there are some good sources like Shodan and, and that may support SecOps activities in ICS environment, but common use cases, rather simple enrichment. So there was nothing left but to pre produce our own uh, based uh, ICS honeypot, uh, where not just looking for IOPs, but TTPs are now under scrutiny. There are many solutions uh, for emulating control protocols, but there are, we found a lot of useful content and existing uh, source code in GitHub and, and, and in, in, in the internet. But there was two points. One is they are just offering a low interactivity level. What is, if you're looking for TTPs, then it's, it's not enough. And the second one, if they are solved with via proxy technology, what require a complex, um, infrastructure and if you would like to automate it then if when i i say that if somebody hit it then it do an automation to put it on uh, uh as it as it as it as a state then it's it's really hard so we build our own uh, modular way and in our mvp we uh checked what is in the electricity the most common uh pro ics protocols modebus s7.com es104 and generic IT protocols like Telnet, FTP, uh, SSH, and so on. Uh, to leverage the power of effectively detecting response ICS-related cyber attacks, it was clear to define the proper techniques, techniques, and procedures. So we do a research as well and pinpoint uh, those techniques, what is targeted uh, on the attack framework heat map to the electricity. Uh, domain. Regarding the infrastructure, there was some important point that we need to figure out during the development, like separating and protecting zones, monitoring and control and condition of the sensors. But that was that was a huge problem, and of course, uh, creating a, a, a packet capture solution. Mm. Our honeypots have been running since 2008, but in order to measure, evaluate the success of their operation, we will review our data between 2019, November 1, until the 4th of December 2020. The data set represents not just the number of attacks, but also the history of honeypot development. 
and that the sense of attack represents a successful interaction of the honeypots. And we filter out mass scan tools and other uh, host wave scans and what, what we found in, in, in the bot uh, libraries. And the reason, because uh, we, we, we would like to focus on, on the human way. And there was a fluctuation uh, as well, what, what, what we saw. And that was because the availability of the cloud providers. And we need to recognize that if you are uh, hiring a, a top cloud provider, then you are under DDoS protection, what is not a normal environment and very for ICS environments. So in the generic, uh, IT, uh, most cases, connections come from both uh, mass scans and, and bots, of course. If that was 87% and already known malicious sources. But because we're, we are looking for just the ICS OT uh, things, that, that was a 23% that we cannot find any other aggregated uh, platforms uh, and existing CTI source. And we have, of course, a lot of open source and a lot of commercial one as well. So we do a double check, but 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 a lot of them was not in this case. And when we do uh, threat hunting, then then this is the 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 crown jewel for us basically. Uh, we have deployed more than a hundred honeypots over the world, but Germany, the UK, the Netherlands, and Singapore have received the most expectionally attacks. The key word for use is maturity, but unfortunately, unfortunately I have to say that we are a long way uh, from the specific use case of threat in the crowd, uh, crowdsource-based sector. But with the SIM or SOAR or IDPS, mm, with the right feeding of sticks, and I mean in sticks feeding, I mean Sigma, Jara, and Snort, uh, of course, next to IOCs, with the right use, then you can make a huge improvement, and not just to threat hunting, but to but to do a good enrichment as well. And but ICS intelligence need no uh, need more knowledge, and. It, it attack vectors and, and the obfuscation. For example, if we are connecting the MITRE framework, the ICS and the enterprise, uh, that could be some really interesting output from it. And there was, and we can do a lot of, for example, watch list if we are, we, we are speaking about the, an average IOCs like IP addresses. So imagine that we have a very well-functioning uh, ISAC. Electricity, water, work, healthcare, doesn't matter. A suspicious malware drops into one member's uh, mailbox. And because of the ISAC, an information sharing analytics center, sector-specific communa for, for, the, for the specialist guy, they, everybody received this, uh, in a sticks feed, this malware or this skill chain and, and have ability for crowdsource analysis. And if somebody get a hit, then they could do an IOC from it, they could do a JAR rules from it, and, and they all of the ISAC members are able to create an IOC and check the exposure of all the members. And now we are far from it, but it could be a goal. And just, just to uh, summarize our experiences, in Hungary, uh, we realized that we need uh, some kind of an ISEC. Uh, therefore, all the members of the Hungarian electricity market, as I mentioned, including companies who are power plants, uh, including SCADA uh, manufacturers, including cybersecurity uh, uh, vendors, including authorities who are responsible for cyber protection, we created... Um, a group called Seconsys, Security for Control Systems. And in the last few years, uh, we tried to first understand each other and uh, find the right uh, way to cooperate and for information sharing. In information sharing, of course, um, such a threat intelligence is a major challenge. Uh, therefore, we can't really solve it to, to share all the information for everyone. But uh, what we have now, uh, we created at least 
um, a recommendation, a book of recommendation uh, for all the sector members. And that was agreed and that was released by our National Cybersecurity Agency as an official recommendation um, for this sector, which is, I think it's important because that is the first step. But just the first step, what else do we need uh, for further steps? First, uh, I have to emphasize that the NIS2 directive, which is uh, currently under negotiation, is very, very needed. It's very, very uh, needed for this market, but NIS2 is not uh, enough. We also need deep technical requirements. And the US-based requirements is useful, but not enough because there are specificities for uh, the national markets. Second, Information sharing is vital, and we have to involve the private and the public sector as well, as it is written in the EU cybersecurity strategy. Therefore, the SOX and the, in, the inclusion of private SOX into information sharing will be also seems to be successful. Third, digital sovereignty in the EU uh, is a prom very, very promising step. Uh, and uh, we think that the national players on the OT systems will help us to protect our national systems. At last but not least, uh, at least uh, we really appreciate that Cycon is existing and the Tally Manual 3.0 proposal, as we think that currently uh, the technicalities is not enough. Therefore, cyber diplomacy should have uh, give the answers for rogue actors, rogue foreign actors. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we are open for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, exciting, really. And, uh, and uh, a question came up. What was the, the selection method for the countries where you uh, installed your honeypots? When we decided where to this geo-analyze is, let's say, um, we measured the, the, not just the, the continents, but the countries as well. And we tried to diversificate as, as, as deep as possible. And most of it in Europe and some percentage in America, but we need to put a lot of, uh, around 23% of our honeypots are working in, in, in Indonesia because, yeah, it's, it's an interesting part of that field. I see. Thank you. Uh, Chaba was uh, talking about information sharing, data sharing, and so on, and Vasilios had the same. Uh, I'm really interested in your opinion. Uh, what do you think? Can we establish a, a layered and a weighted threat uh, uh, network which can communicate active issues in, in timely manner? So what is more important, that is the first and so on, uh, in an international level. Uh, Chaba, I would like you to, to answer this question first. On the international level, I think uh, we have to do that. So again, uh, we see the problems of mid-sized and small countries. Um, although maybe our uh, cybersecurity agencies have uh, the, have some information, uh, some CTIs that should be shared, but at the end of the day, uh, those information um, doesn't really get into or arrive uh, to the critical information infrastructures due to a lot of uh, problems, including technical information, and of course, uh, because um, they have to keep a lot of information in secret. Therefore, we have to open up. And I think that uh, the uh, sticks and taxi protocols, sticks was mentioned by Gergő, can be a good approach to somehow share such information on the international level as well. Thank you. And uh, Vasilios, what is your point of view? Yes, um, I totally agree, uh, actually, uh, with regards to uh, sticks and, stack and sticks and taxi. Um, no matter what, um, the future of sharing uh, threat information, threat intelligence, um, is always about being machine readable. Um, nowadays, we cannot afford to have just um, human agents uh, analyzing everything. Um, with regards to internationalization, uh, yes, uh, it's too important, but um, I'm going to talk mainly about the um, um, EU horizon that we do have some uh, Isaac initiatives um, that they do uh, good work, but uh, we need to do it even better. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I agree with you. 
a question uh, for uh, Chaba. Would you or who would you motivate private companies to share cyber incident related information? Because you mentioned it's a very, very huge problem. Yeah, our experience is that uh, the question is, it, it really belongs to trust. Therefore, in the first year of uh, the history of Seconsys, uh, we had a lot of personal workshops uh, before the COVID, of course, uh, to build up trust between the different actors. And they understood that they have to share as much information as they can. And uh, it seems after three years of this cooperation, it seems that they are really open to cooperate. The, uh, it's very simple. Uh, currently, we know each other and we have the trust. So I would emphasize, emphasize again, trust is the answer for that question. I see. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm a little bit sad because uh, the time is over. Unfortunately, we were not able to, to accept all the questions for the audience. Thank you for your activity. Please be kind and follow the SICOM. So we are going to have now a 20 minutes break. Then a discussion comes at 17.20 about the hot topic of disinformation that can be followed or stage one. Please follow us. <laughs>